Hey, Kyle with Driveline Baseball here, and I get a ton of questions about weighted baseball training considering we're pretty much the foremost authority on sports science when it comes to weighted baseball, plyo care training, and the like. Um, discussing why they work would take days, if not weeks of time, to actually discuss all the experiments we've done in our lab, all the peer-reviewed research out there that proves that they work, um, and the results that we've gotten. Obviously, we have, you've seen the videos, uh, we have three or four guys throwing over 100 miles an hour and tons of guys in professional and collegiate baseball and using our products and services, including the 2014 College World Series champion, Vanderbilt. Um, so it's obvious that they work, um, but the more detailed of us want to know why. And so today we'll kind of break it down into understanding total force versus peak force. So understanding that weighted baseball training on overload stuff um, increases total force and underload training with the baseballs increases peak force. By, what I mean by that is a 5-ounce ball thrown at 90 miles an hour weighs somewhere between 20 and 40 pounds uh, when it's laid back in maximum external rotation. So the term for that is inertial mass. Uh, when that 5-ounce ball is accelerated backwards in external rotation and scapular tilt, really what we would call forearm layback is a way more anatomically correct term, um, it you know ends up weighing a weighing a lot in that externally rotated loaded position. So if you increase the weight of that implement to seven ounces, say, a two ounce in over, two ounce overload stress on a baseball, uh, then that loaded position back there becomes significantly more stressful. So you might argue that that really increases peak force. However, we have to consider the entire system. When that arm is laid back consistently or considerably back there with that seven ounce ball, it has to then be accelerated out front. A 7-ounce ball is much harder to accelerate than a 5-ounce ball for obvious reasons. It weighs significantly more. So the total amount of stress on the body on most, amount of, on most people's pitching mechanics depends on the kinematics at, that are present. Total force goes up, and peak force actually is much lower than a regular baseball. Uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. The reverse is true as well. Say you have a 3-ounce ball, that's a 2-ounce underload stress, in external rotation, the stress is much lower than it would be with a baseball or obviously a 7-ounce ball. However, it then has to be accelerated over a longer period of time. Therefore, peak force goes significantly up because a 3-ounce ball can be thrown so much faster than a 7-ounce ball. So again, peak force goes way up, but total force is much further down. So this is understanding this duality really helps us to grasp how we should train, right? The overload stresses are significantly more safe on the body, for example, because the body was designed for chronic adaptation of total force. It was meant to endure constant evolutionary pressure, to constantly get stronger, to get more, you know, to get stronger, to get more fit, um, whatever term you want to use. The, you know, the correct sports science term would be fitness. But that could mean anything, you know, that term has been adopted by CrossFit uh, and boot camps and stuff like that, and that no longer really means what it really should mean, which is an increased adaptation level of the tissues and the neural capacity of those muscles. So really it's all about motor unit recruitment. So from a total perspective, or from a total force perspective, overload training is vastly superior. It's also much safer on the arm. However, that's not really all we want, right? We don't want the ability to produce significant speed strength or strength speed or however you want to say it um, through a total force. You know, what we're really interested in is end velocity, right? And that's where peak force is so huge. However, the body is not meant to deal with huge stressors of a one-time one -time peak force that it's never experienced before. Uh, I mean, an extreme example would be like a gunshot wound or, you know, a very traumatic incident where the peak force vastly exceeds the tissue, pre the, you know, the, the ability of the tissue to withstand that type of force. Now, I'm not saying throwing a three-ounce ball is like getting shot with a gun. It's not. However, throwing a three-ounce ball without adequate total force training opens yourself up to serious risk. That's why there's all these programs out there that use underload training and throwing light implements are very dangerous. Um, and it's why the progress, successful programs like the NPA's holds, hold and Velocity Plus and arm care programs uh, who use holds with their bowls um, makes a lot of sense to them, right? And it definitely does because they say they want to train the posterior shoulder, that the brakes of the shoulder should be large, and it should help accept larger amounts of force. And that all makes sense. However, holds 
uh, don't necessarily get the job done, as mentioned on our blog, and we'll link some of the stuff below here so you can read our research on why we no longer use holds. Um, so to kind of go back before I get too far off track, is understanding that total force versus peak force is a very, very important um, continuum to understand. Right? Overload training helps build the base, helps build the engine, it helps build the transmission, it helps build the understanding that the body is going to accept larger and larger amounts of force, it helps train adaptation in and of itself. You have increased ability to accept adaptation. Right? So by training total force using overload implements, you become better at training. By training peak force, you become better at expressing the underlying fitness level again. That's speed, strength, that's velocity, that's rotational velocity. Whatever you want to call it, it really is fitness. That is the real word for it. Um, so both are important. However, by training peak force without training that total force, you're learning to express higher and higher amounts of this genetic maximum without having trained the engine first. And so that's a recipe for disaster as well as inefficiency. It's why any good program would have you train using overload implements primarily for a long period of time. Compliance has to be number one. It's exactly like a seminar I gave in Indiana. Without compliance with the overload, the boring stuff by building the base, you don't get to do the fun stuff. The peak training, the stuff you see on our YouTube of guys throwing 103 miles an hour or two ounce balls over 113 miles an hour, that didn't, they didn't do that on their first day. They were able to express that fitness by training the total side of it. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense on understanding total versus peak force, overload versus underload, and how you combine the two. Thanks again for watching.